Good afternoon everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here today. My name is Kate Medill. I am a lecturer at the University of Sydney and I am a speech pathologist and I've been asked today to come and talk to you guys about uh, what it's like to be a speech pathologist. I'll talk to a little bit about also being uh, a university lecturer and tell you a few of the other things that I do and I'll also tell you how I got to be sitting here today. So, what is a speech pathologist? I get asked this all the time. A speech pathologist is the same thing as a speech therapist. There is no difference, it's just a different term. So, as a speech pathologist we work with children or adults or sometimes both to help people with all types of communication, swallowing or feeding problems. Now those problems could be of a medical origin, they could be physical, they could be developmental, so they've just sort of happened as people have been growing up. They could be psychological, they could be because of their education, or they could be a social problem. So let's have a look at some of the problems that we encounter as speech pathologists. We put them into, into different categories uh, and in the profession we actually sp often specialise in a particular category that we're going to go through now and we can sometimes specialise in either working with children or working with adults. So the first category is what we call a speech problem. So that might be a lisp and if you're a cartoon fan, which I am, uh, Sylvester the cat had, has a very big lisp when he goes thuffer and thuckatash. So any articulation problem like that where the words don't come out right uh, or they're inaccurate, we would classify that as a speech problem. And the big uh, consequence of a speech problem is that people find it very hard to understand you. You know exactly what you want to say, you can think of all the right words, but when they come out people don't understand you very well. One of the other categories of problems that we deal with and help people with is language. So an example is not keeping up with your reading or writing in class because you find it difficult to understand the words that you're reading or you can't think of the right word or when you write a sentence uh, that comes, the words aren't in the right order and so people read it and they don't really understand it. Now as you guys know, re reading and writing and language is pretty much a basic foundation of most of the things we do in education. So speech pathologists play a huge role in helping people uh, get up to speed with their language so that they can communicate in the way that they want to and at the level that they want to. Um, and certainly it plays an enormous role in pretty much every occupation in, uh, in Australian society. So it's a really important area of speech pathology and certainly a lot of the speech pathologists uh, who work with children work in both speech and language. Mind you, that said, certainly we see plenty of adults that uh, have problems with their speech. Sometimes, I'm just going to pop back and remind you, sometimes it can be because they have a very strong accent which means that they can't that other people can't understand them very well and we have to work on their speech sounds and sometimes uh, they have problems being able to use language if they've had a stroke um, and part of their brain, the language part of their brain isn't working or if um, they're actually using, an, they're used to uh, another language and they now have to use, for example, English as a first language. We also deal with people who stutter. Now most people uh, will know certainly in the last few years of the movie The King's Speech and of course in The King's Speech um, the, the King had a very large stutter and it was a huge problem in his life. So the, uh, the doctor in The King's Speech, Lionel, he was certainly a, a, in, in his time a leader in speech pathology, in what would have been speech pathology, it wasn't called speech pathology then, it was called elocution. But we nowadays treat not only adults but children 
with stuttering and we can now cure very young children of stuttering so it doesn't develop into older age. We also treat people with voice problems and this is my area of specialty. So you will know many people with voice problems, probably if you've heard Adele sing or know of her problems with her voice, John Mayer, he's got a huge voice problem and has had lots and lots of problems and I believe has just called off yet another tour because of his voice. So in speech pathology practice, the sort of problems that we see include lots of school teachers because they get lots of voice problems because they have to talk over lots of kids and use their voice for long periods of time, lots of singers, actors. In fact, something like 30% of jobs require your voice to, to, to do your job. So if you have to do it for a long period of time and you have to use it at a very loud volume, uh, you can end up with swollen vocal cords or nodules or things like that. So speech pathologists help and those sorts of conditions and they work very closely with medical specialists to help all these professionals get back to work and get their voices back doing what they need to do. We also deal with social communication. This is sort of a, a bit of a hard area to describe and it can be a result of lots of different types of problems. So some children often who um, have autism find it very difficult to know when and how to communicate to other people. So a speech pathologist will come in and work with them and teach them how to uh, recognise when it is the right time to talk, what sort of things uh, we need to do when we talk like make eye contact, we need to wait for the other person to talk. Um, we also need to teach people this after they've sometimes had very big car accidents and they've got lots of brain damage. Um, we find that in those cases people suffer damage to their brain just at the very front part of their brain and that then makes it very difficult for them to judge the rules of communication. So we do a lot of very very important work in helping people recover from brain injury and getting back to normal so they can communicate with their friends and family. We also do a lot of work in swallowing and a lot of people don't know that one, this is a whole area of uh, health care uh, that's really important, but also that speech pathologists are the ones that help you with it if you have a problem. So at this point you now need to imagine what it would be like if you took your water bottle and you had a mouthful of water, like I'm going to do, and just as you swallowed it, it went down the wrong way and you coughed and choked and, ch and, and you couldn't stop coughing. Now if you did that and we could take a picture of it, we would see all the fluid that you were swallowing go down into your throat if we took an x-ray. Now some people after a stroke, after a car accident, sometimes as a result of a disease like Parkinson's disease, find it that their swallowing become, gets very, very disorganised and they can't eat or drink normally. So that's where a speech pathologist is the expert to come in and assess what the problem is and then make recommendations about whether they could position their head differently, whether they could do exercises to improve their swallow, whether they need a different texture or a different thickness of fluid. Now at this stage you might be thinking this is all sounding pretty dry and boring. Very medical but sort of not so medical. I think, obviously I enjoy the work that I do, but I think that the work we do in swallowing is in some ways the most gratifying in the job. Because going and having a coffee and a chat with a friend is the most normal everyday thing and it brings us so much pleasure. You think about all the times today, tomorrow, yesterday that you've grabbed your best friend and your lunch and you've gone and you've sat, in the, sat somewhere and you've eaten your lunch and you've had a chat and you've done all those things and you've caught up with the day and what's happening. If you have a communication problem or a swallowing problem, just doing that 
becomes so incredibly difficult. So as a speech pathologist, if we can help people eat more normally, enjoy the simple pleasures of eating, if we can help them communicate more easily without stress, without pain, without confusion and frustration, that is a wonderful gift that we can give to the people that we work with. So it really is a great profession. Now obviously I think that because I work in it, but I didn't always work in it. So I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute. Before I do, I just want to tell you about one of the other, the last sort of areas that we work, work in as speech pathologists, and that is what we call multimodal communication. And I've given you a link here to a little YouTube clip, which will give you just a little bit of a sense of a real life, well, it's a cartoon of a real life uh, situation where communication can break down. So have a look at it and have a think about uh, what's going on and have a think, if you were a speech pathologist, some of the things that you could do to help the people in the video. Someone else that you also might know, because he's pretty famous, who uses multimodal communication and has pretty much all of his adult life is Stephen Hawking, the famous astrophysicist. He communicates only through a machine. He is one of the great world leaders and the great thinkers of our time, but for the vast majority of his adult life and in most of the major contributions he's made, he has communicated verbally through a machine. That is, the machine has done the talking for him. Now, as you're, I'm sure you're also well aware, he is now completely unable to move. So he is now very dependent on his carers and very much a good speech pathologist to help manage his technology so he can communicate as easily as I am to you now, although not quite as easily. But he can still go and make an enormous impact on not only the American uh, thinking system, but the world. So we get to work with fabulous people as speech pathologists. We work with fabulous people, we work with ordinary people, we work with mums, dads, kids, adolescents, grandmas, grandpas. And we work with them when life is tough, when they're in crisis, when some of the most basic and essential functions of life are difficult or impossible or have been taken from them. It's a very privileged place to be. It's a very moving place to be and we're very lucky because we get to make a real difference. As I said, if you could feel good about your job, then that's a good job. A good job is also a job where you get paid decent money. And speech pathologists get paid decent money as well. We don't know many rich speech pathologists, but richness can be measured in many ways. So have a think about how you would feel if you could help somebody achieve their goal. If their goal was saying hello to somebody they'd never met without stuttering and taking 30 seconds or a minute to do so. Think how you'd feel if you could help somebody just sit down and eat a meal with their friends without choking and coughing and spluttering or drooling or dribbling. Think about how you would feel if you could help somebody work all day without getting a sore throat, getting tired, getting exhausted and feeling completely beaten just by the fact that they wanted to talk. And think about how you would feel if you could help people find the words to say what they want and how they feel. It's very empowering stuff. It's a great job. I love it. But it's not always what I wanted to do. So let me tell you now a little bit about my journey. I grew up in Tasmania. I didn't grow up on Cradle Mountain, which this is a photo of, because it's very cold up there. But I did grow up in Tasmania and I grew up on a farm and we had sheep and I rode horses and it was very cool. I was lucky, I had a great family, very supportive family, went to a great school. And at my school, 
we, we were really encouraged to do lots of different things. Yeah, we were encouraged to work and study hard. Yep, all good. But we were also encouraged to sing in the choir, be in the play, play sport. So I was very lucky I got to do lots and lots of different things. I was very much encouraged in my acting pursuits. I always loved acting. Apparently my parents tell me I was a bit like that as a kid. But I had a great opportunity in grade nine when the, lo when the acting teacher told me that there was a performance of The King and I on by the local amateur theatre company. Which by the way, Launceston has the oldest amateur theatre company in the Southern Hemisphere. So I was lucky to grow up there too. So I went and auditioned for The King and I and I got in uh, as a boy, even though I was a girl. So I got a big role as my first lead role uh, in a musical and I loved it and it was great. So I thought, oh, I really want to keep doing more of this and I did. I did, lot, I did three more amateur musicals while I was studying and I performed in the school musicals as well. So at this stage of the game I was thinking acting was very cool, I loved it, that's what I wanted to do. I think everybody around me was going, this is going to be bad because actors don't make any money. However, everyone was supportive and so on I went. Now you might wonder who this is. This is Sally Fields and this is a picture of Sally Fields in the movie Sybil. And why I have it on the screen is because in Launceston back in 1987, at my school you could study psychology. And I enrolled in the psychology course and it was during this course and seeing this movie that really inspired my interest in people's behaviour and in psychology. So I was really interested in acting, I was really interested in psychology. At the same time I had to do biology, that was one of my subjects I had to do, I didn't have a choice in that. And being very focused on my acting, which I got good marks in, not great but good, and being very focused on psychology, which I got good marks in, I also happened to get the top mark in the class and the school for biology, but, but completely by accident and I didn't even notice. And I didn't actually notice until 10 years later. I had completely forgotten. Because to me then, biology didn't matter. It wasn't important. I was focused on acting. So, being very supportive, uh, my parents helped me apply, in fact audition, to get into the only university in the country where you could do acting and psychology as a double major. And that was Flinders University in Adelaide. So I auditioned, I think there were about 4,000 people auditioned and they accepted 18 and I was one of them. Now I'm just going to put in a little caveat here, a little uh, comment. When I told people in HSC that I wanted to be an actor, they said go and talk to the local director and he was a NIDA graduate and he said to me and maybe some of you have heard this already if you can do anything other than acting do that don't do acting and at that time I said yeah right whatever yeah yeah later on and now I understand what he meant but back then I thought no I really want to do acting there's nothing else I want to do so you know what I did it and I don't have any regrets so I went to Adelaide and I did acting and I did psychology and after a year of psychology and reading about rats in cages and lots and lots of numbers and statistics I thought no psychology is not for me so I dropped out of my psychology stream and I specialised in acting and in my third year I got into the honours program and in my honours program I got to specialise in working with other actors on their voice and this is probably where my path to being a speech pathologist started. Because at this stage I'd never heard of a speech pathologist, ever. Didn't know what it was. So, I started learning all about voice technique and all the different ways that people can change their voices. And I was very lucky to have a very supportive lecturer. And we did lots of very fun stuff looking at different scripts and all the different things you could do with your voice. And I loved it and it was great fun and, we, and I did very well. And so I graduated with honours in the performance stream uh, but with an honours in voice. Great, I graduated. By this stage now though, 
I wasn't so focused on being an actor, but I thought, well, I've got, I've got the degree, I should go and be an actor. About then, uh, I met some people, just socially, it wasn't, you know, a big deal, uh, who lived in Sydney. And one of them said, look, we're going away on holidays for four weeks and we need someone to house sit our house. And I had just finished my university course and was going to move to Melbourne, where my extended family lived. So I would sort of set up there and try and be an actor. And so I took up this offer. I'd never really been to Sydney before. I thought, great, four weeks free holiday in Sydney. Great. So I packed up my little car, put all my possessions in it and drove to Sydney. And house that on the way to Melbourne, apparently. That was the story. So this was 22 years ago that I arrived in Sydney and house sat. And at that point, my life was set. I was going back to Melbourne to set my acting career up. I've never made it to Melbourne, so technically I'm still house sitting. I'll just let you know that. So I then tried to get work as an actor. Now, none of this is going to make sense yet, so just sit tight because the story takes a bit of a turn here. So I get an agent uh, to help me get acting work. And at this stage, I was young. I didn't know too much. And so the agent started sending me off to all these courses which I had to pay for. So I had to get a decent paying job. So I did. I got a job as a barmaid. And I got a job at a place called the Imperial Hotel, which is in the inner city of Sydney in Erskineville and its claim to fame is that is where they filmed the beginning of the film Priscilla and in fact I worked in the bar while they were filming Priscilla and I worked at that hotel for three years full time and started to get despite Priscilla coming to town very bored because I was auditioning I was doing local theatre productions but I wasn't making any money I was having fun though I was having a great time the way I paid my bills was by working in hospitality. And this is a really common story in the entertainment industry. I dabbled in going back to university. I went back to the University of Western Sydney to enrol in the performance course to actually do a research study. Because when I'd left Flinders, I wanted to know how, if you changed the sound of your voice, whether people perceived your personality differently. It seemed to be the case, but nobody had ever investigated it. So I started that course, but because it was an hour and a half drive, because I enrolled part-time, and unfortunately right at that time, the team of people that were my supervisors didn't quite have the knowledge, and neither did I, to answer the question. So after six months, I thought, you know what, this is not the right time to do this. And that was cool, that was okay. Because little did I know the time was coming so after three years of working at the Imperial Hotel and getting very bored sitting in a bar nine hours a day and sometimes into the wee hours, I thought I need a change. It would be great to work outside. It would be great to work with animals. I'd always worked with animals. So one day I picked up the local free paper and in that local free paper buried in the classified ads was a little ad that said animal trainers wanted for out of town movie, uh, I think they will use the term wranglers, and I thought that's interesting, I'll ring up. So I rang up and I applied and I got a job working as an animal trainer on Babe. So I moved to Robertson where they filmed the, the movie Babe and for nine months I worked on the movie and I trained the animals, more specifically the sheep, and had a great time. In fact, it turned out to be my only movie credit uh, as an actor. Well, not even as an actor. I sometimes joke that I taught the animals to talk, but I can say that now, but no, I didn't. I just trained them to go in the right direction. And while I was doing that, I realised that, because I was working very long hours out in the country, sitting with animals that didn't actually talk very much, I realised that the thing that I absolutely wanted to do was work with people's voices. I had always kept up my interest, I'd done workshops, I'd done short courses, but for fun because it made, it, it satisfied my curiosity. 
So while I was out in the country, I decided that I was going to, going to go back to university and do voice training. Now at that stage I thought that was going to be in the arts. But I'd met a lot of speech pathologists doing the voice courses that I'd wanted to do. And at one stage I spoke to one of them and, about my intent and they said, you should do speech pathology, you'd make a great speech pathologist. So this by this time I'm 25, so I can't just enrol in a speech pathology course, I have to go through the mature age entry. So I do, and because I've met lots of people through doing these courses, one of the, uh, the senior speech pathologists at a Sydney hospital gives me a reference, and next thing you know, I'm back at, I'm at Sydney University, one of the top universities in the country, doing speech pathology. Now, it's weird. I'd wanted to be an actor, I'd wanted to do psychology, but I'd never thought of being a speech pathologist. I didn't even know what allied health meant. So, on I went in my journey. I enrolled in the four-year course with lots and lots of 18-year-olds, so I was part of the mature age group. I nearly failed in first semester of first year because it was really hard going back to study and it was in science. And it was at this point I realised, as I nearly failed one of my science subjects, that I thought back to my HSC. Because I'd always been focused on acting, I never thought I was very smart. But my biology exam in HSC proved that I was and that I could be good at science. And so after I nearly failed and did that reflection, I thought, you know what, maybe you're okay at this. And once I started thinking I was okay at it, I got very okay at it and I really enjoyed it. And I did so well that I got asked to do honours in second year. So I got invited to do that. Why? Because you know that study that I'd started a few years before that I didn't finish at the University of Western Sydney? Well, I talked to my lecturers about that study because I was really excited about it. And they were so keen for me to pursue that study and they saw that I was so keen to do that research that it, they said to me years later that even if I hadn't have got the marks, they were going to try and get me in to that course because they saw how keen I was. So I did do my honours and I did do my research project that I hadn't been able to do the years before. I did so well, I got the university medal. And that was pretty fantastic and I really enjoyed it. I worked three jobs because I, I went back to the Imperial Hotel while I was studying. And I do remember studying my neurology and chemistry and biology and psychology and linguistics in between serving drinks at the bar. So needless to say, you can work hard and have fun as well. So then I graduated and then I had to get a job because I didn't want to keep working at the bar. I'd done my time. I was a professional now. So I got invited back to Adelaide to work in a voice specialty practice. So that is a speech pathologist that only sees voice patients. And I was thrilled because that's really what I wanted to do. And I had a great time. But you know what? I had lived in Sydney now for ooh, a good eight, nine years. And Adelaide didn't suit me anymore. It was a small town compared to Sydney. And I then got a phone call from the university that I just left, from the speech pathology department saying, our voice lecturer has just left. Would you come back and teach the voice lectures for us? Wow, I was pretty stoked. That's, that was very cool. Very bit frightening, I'd only just graduated. But I thought, you know what, I can't say no. So back I went to Sydney. And not only did I lecture, for the semester. That's not me, by the way, just so you know. Um, I started doing research because with a university medal, it was very easy to enrol in a PhD. Why did I do that? I just got a job, I could earn money, I could have fun, I didn't have to study anymore. Well, maybe I'm a bit of a nerd, but my idea of wanting to find out why we make judgments about people based on the sound of their voice was really powerful for me. It was very, very compelling. And I think it's because I have always been interested in how we know people through the way that we sound and the way that we talk. So since then, I have continued to lecture, 
to do research. I worked in other speech pathology jobs. Those jobs included working in a hospital, a, a rehabilitation hospital. It included working in other private practices. And I really enjoyed that work. But what I discovered about myself in that work is that I don't like working one job nine to five. I like variety. I like doing different things. So now I do lots of different things. Because as well as, because now I have a full-time job at the university as a, an academic, but as well as that, I also have my own private practice. So I have my own business. And in fact, I have a secondary business in Adelaide that does the same thing. We, uh, we see patients or, or people with voice problems and uh, some of the other problems I've talked about, swallowing problems, speech problems. I uh, have four people uh, four other speech pathologists that work for me in Sydney and two others that work in Adelaide. And we also run now what is now an international voice training business whereby we give voice workshops all over the world so that we can bring the latest science of voice training to other speech pathologists, to actors, singers and other what we call voice professionals. So, I'm very lucky. I get to do lots of different things. I have my own research laboratory and we do find out new things about how the voice works all the time. I write research papers. I lecture. In my private practice, I see professional actors and singers with voice problems. And I will have seen people that you certainly would know and have seen on the television. I work with teachers who lose their voice all the time. I now am in a stage of my career now that I have to manage other people at the university so I manage the very large on-campus clinic that we have and I also, and this is a little clip from a, uh, an online story from the Sydney Morning Herald that appeared in January this year, I often get asked by journalists to talk about how the voice and how speech is so important to our everyday communication. So I have a really interesting and varied job. So when I got asked to talk about my average day, well, my average day is in no way average. I can wake up in the morning, I can go to work, I can review a research paper, I can meet with some students, I can give a lecture, I can go into the laboratory and conduct experiments on our subjects. I can then, in the afternoon, go out to my private practice and see four or five patients. So, just so, as I finish up now, I just wanted to let you know what, when I reflect on all of that, what I think I've learnt. And hopefully it might be helpful to some of you. In life you get what you expect. So when I expected things to be bad, they were bad. When I expected things to be good, they were amazing. So I've learnt that a lot of helping me work out problems or working out how I'm going to get from one, one, one point to another point, how I might achieve a goal, a lot of that is expecting that I'm going to succeed and reminding myself that if I step it out, and take my time, ask for help, if I keep expecting to succeed, I'm going to. I've also learnt that it pays off if you never give up. I'm a pretty persistent person, I've realised, and it's not unpleasant, but I, ne I never gave up on the things that really mattered. Some people say, do you ever miss acting? And I go, well, no, because I get to perform every time I give a lecture. I get to sing with my patients, and that satisfies me. So no, I don't miss acting. Did I give up on it? No, I realised working in that industry wasn't for me, but I could take all of those skills into another industry that was way more satisfying. I've learnt that your friends and your family can, will help you achieve anything you can dream of. It's very hard to do anything on your own. So your friends and family are absolutely essential to helping you, supporting you, having fun with you. So, Dream big. Go for it. Nothing to lose at this stage of the game. So 
Make sure you have some fun along the way. And thank you very, very much for taking the time to have listened to me. So I'll take any questions. Thank you. That's a great question. It varies depending on the university. So this year I think the University of Sydney had an ATAR of uh, 89. Um, but other courses, and there are many other courses in Australia, have uh, slightly lower ATARs. And there are many different pathways you can get into speech pathology. Certainly I know, in, and as you can see, my pathway was a very odd pathway. Um, but if you were coming straight from school, you can either do, uh, for example, at the University of Sydney has a four-year undergraduate degree, so you can go straight in if you've got the ATAR to get in, do four years, and then you'll be a graduated speech pathologist and able to work in, in, in the profession immediately. You can also do another degree, and we offer a Bachelor of Health Sciences, or you might do an arts degree or an, an education degree, and then you can come back and do a two-year uh, master's course which is a professional degree and after completing that you can then be a speech pathologist. But different courses have slightly different variations of that. Okay, I'm not quite sure what you mean. Social work is actually a whole different course. But we have social work courses studied on the same campuses and in the same faculties. So we have an awareness. So speech pathologists work with social workers, um, but they're actually very different professions and they need differences in their skill sets. We have a professional association called Speech Pathology Australia and that is our, within our profession, it's our own self-regulatory body. So we self-regulate as a profession. Uh, we would love for it to be a uh, government recognised regulatory body and we continue to uh, lobby the government to make that so. Um, but we have very high standards that we uh, regulate ourselves as a profession. And whilst you don't have to be a member of Speech Pathology Australia to practice speech pathology, in any public sector job you need to be eligible. That is, you need to have a formal qualification. And certainly we do enormous amounts of community education to let the community know that a speech pathologist needs to have an appropriate degree um, from a recognised university with an accredited course to call themselves a speech pathologist. I haven't treated any kings, unfortunately, um, and I haven't tre I've treated a couple of people with, with uh, stutters and they're great people to work with because we now have treatments that are very, very effective and are a bit more effective than you see in the movie. So it's, uh, it's, a, great, it's a great job. We love working with people, uh, especially when we can really make a big difference. Okay, well, it depends uh, which way you get into the university. If you do the two-year master's course, it is quite expensive. Um, I believe it's about uh, ranges between thirty to forty thousand dollars if you pay uh, through that those means. Um, if you get into an undergraduate degree and you qualify for HEX, um, then of course you pay for it once you get a job and you start paying taxes through the HEX, the government HEX scheme. But those costs vary between uh, universities and many of the universities have different scholarship programs um, that people can apply for to waive fees as well. In terms of getting jobs after you graduate, at the moment uh, there are more jobs in the country and in regional areas than in the cities. So it's a healthy profession. Um, so there are 
There's not lots and lots of speech pathologists, but there are a number of courses at the moment. So you will have a better chance of getting a job, certainly if you work in regional areas. What we find with all of our graduates is the pretty much all of them, and I can't even think of any exceptions at the moment, uh, get a job within the first 12 months. It's often not their ideal job, but they get a job. And once they get a job, whether it be as a part-time job or as someone goes off on maternity leave and they get the job for three months, once they get that first job, then they keep getting jobs and they eventually get into the area of specialty that they really like. So while sometimes those first sort of three to six months there's lots of people having just graduated and everybody's looking for a job, that can sometimes be a little bit nerve-wracking, going, oh, I'm not going to get a job. But most people get that, get that first job within the first year and that's, then they stay in some form of employment uh, sin, uh, from then on. The other great thing about speech pathology, which we don't often talk about, is that there are often a lot of part-time positions and we have a lot of people go off on maternity leave. Because we have a lot of women that work in, in the profession um, and young women, they get to a point in their life where they want to go off and have children. So they leave the profession momentar uh, momentarily, they leave it for a number of years. So there's often a, a, quite a turnover of jobs within the profession. So as long as you're persistent and as long as you've, you've, you've done well, then you'll, uh, you won't have a problem getting a job. We do do PRAC training during our study, uh, during uh, our courses, and that makes up a lot of uh, a lot of the course time. It is a busy course, um, but yes, certainly in the Sydney courses and undergraduate, you will be seeing patients, uh, treating clients within our on-campus clinic in the second year, and uh, from then on in, you will be seeing clients in schools, in hospitals, through all the different practical courses that we offer. So you, you get hands on very quickly and if you do the master's course you actually start working with clients almost immediately. Thank you very much, all the best and maybe we'll see you one day.